So you've got a company idea, you've incorporated, and you're ready to raise money to fuel growth. The mechanics of startup financing, though, can be really overwhelming. What's the difference between convertible notes, safes, and price rounds? What are options pools, liquidity preference, or other key financing terms? All of this may seem non-core to your startup business itself, but it's important to understand because it can impact your own pocketbook as a founder and what you and your company can do in really important ways. I'm a venture capitalist at Signalfire, a billion dollar venture fund based in Silicon Valley. Over the last decade, I've been a part of more than hundred startup financings. And in this video, I'm gonna cover the key startup financing terms you need to know. When you raise money from venture capitalists, you can do it in one of two ways. You can either sell new shares of your company in what's called an equity financing or price round, or you can sell the right to receive shares in your company in the future through convertible notes such as safes. When you first start your company, you own 100% of it in common shares. When you raise money from investors in a price round, you're selling them newly issued shares called preferred stock that has special rights attached to it. As part of that transaction, there's really two things at the end of the day you need to negotiate with investors, and that's economics and control. Economics is everything that relates to how much money the investor will make. And control is everything that relates to how investors can make or affect important decisions for the company. The most visible economics related term for the founders is the price, which is measured by pre and post money valuation of the business. The pre money valuation is what investors value the company at today before the investment. And the post money valuation is just the pre money valuation plus the amount of cash investment. Pretty simple, and it makes sense, right? Because if you give a company money, it's gonna become more valuable. The best way to negotiate price is to get competitive auction dynamics from multiple VCs who wanna invest in your company. This is just basic economics 101. If you have more demand for your company's shares than supply, you're gonna get a higher price. Valuation matters because it directly affects likely the most important thing that you care about as a founder in a deal, which is how much of your company you're giving up to investors, called dilution. Dilution you're taking as a founder is just equivalent to the ownership that you're giving up to investors as part of the financing. And it's equal to the amount that you raise divided by the post money valuation. So if you raise 20 million at a post money valuation of $50 million, you're giving up 40% of your company to investors. If you raise that same 20 million at 100 million post money valuation, you're only giving up 20% of your company. But there are other things that impact dilution too, like the options pool. You and your investors wanna make sure the company has enough equity to compensate your future employees and keep them motivated. So the company sets aside part of its shares to do that. You might think a bigger options pool is better for the company. And while it's good to make sure you don't run out of shares for employees, the options pool almost always comes out of the founder's share of equity upfront. So to go back to our fundraising example, if you raise 20 million on a 100 million valuation with a 10% options pool, you're actually giving up closer to 30% of your company in the round. Sometimes venture funds ask for warrants for extra shares on the side, which is generally not a good idea unless the venture fund is adding some really substantial value that you can assess in real monetary terms. Otherwise, besides being a bad deal for you, it's probably gonna piss off other investors who don't get the same warrants and create a lot of unnecessary headache for you down the road. The last important economic term you need to know is liquidity preference. When you sell your company, the owners of preferred shares are paid back first before common shares. And typically they're entitled to all their money back first, which is called a 1x liquidity preference. As you go up from there to say 2x or 5x liquidity preference, that can distort incentives and make founders take too much risk because founders don't get anything back unless the company gets really big. Investors may also ask for what's called participating preferred shares, which is kind of like double dipping in the case of a sale. Investors not only get their money back first, they also get their fair share of anything that's left over. Again, not something I recommend because it distorts incentives. So in recapping the economics of a deal, the thing to remember is that price isn't everything. There's a saying, you pick the price and I pick the terms and all get the better deal every time. For example, say you raise that 20 million at 100 million valuation. Sounds great, right? Well, if you agreed to a 5X liquidation preference, then if your company sold for 100 million, your investors would be entitled to 5X their investment or all of that 100 million, and you wouldn't have a single dollar. That's why you gotta pay attention to more than just price. Beyond economics, VCs also care about control provisions to protect their investment. The most important way they do this is by taking a board seat that holds a vote on key decisions, like important hires and compensation packages. More generally, the board of directors is responsible for helping guide strategic decisions of the company as a check and balance to the CEO. A typical early stage board will have one or two founders, one or two investors, and then sometimes an independent director. You usually see an odd number of board seats so that voting doesn't deadlock, and for most early stage startups, most of the board seats still reside with the founders so they retain control. That can change over time as a company scales, such that investors collectively have control and can, for example, decide to replace a CEO if they don't feel he or she is performing well. If a VC invests in a company at a $100 million valuation and the company immediately gets bought for the same amount, that's life-changing money for the founder, but zero return for the investor. 
Protective provisions are veto rights to certain key decisions like that where founders and investors can be at odds. Investors also want to protect the company if founders end up leaving. The way investors incentivize founders to stay is with a term called founder vesting. Typically, a founder's stock will vest over four years, meaning they have to be employed at the company for all four years to get all of their stock. And if you leave the company earlier than that, you only get the percentage of stock that you earned. The standard vesting schedule for early stage companies is a one year cliff and monthly vesting thereafter. That means if you leave before a year, you don't get any stock. And at the one year mark, you immediately get 25% of your stock in one hit. That's called the cliff. And then you vest the remaining 75% equally each month over the remaining three years. Sometimes founders get 50% or more of their stock vested up front. And that typically happens when they've been building for a much longer time than typical and can negotiate some credit for the work they've done. You also need to figure out what happens to founder shares if the company gets bought. A single trigger acceleration means the founder gets all of their shares, even unvested ones. But most acquirers will want there to be some unvested shares so that they can keep the founders around and motivated. That's why a double trigger is more standard and it means that two things need to happen before a founder gets all their shares, like the acquisition completing and the founder being let go from the acquiring company. Vesting is important for the company as a whole, not just investors, because you don't want to be in a situation where one founder doesn't pull their weight and they can just leave the company with all their shares. Founder divorces happen, unfortunately, more often than you might think, so it's helpful to have that prenup in place. Finally, investors will be negotiating for what's called major investor rights, of which the most important is pro rata rights. If things go well, this is probably not the last time the company will need to fundraise. Pro rata rights give investors the chance to invest their share of the next round so they can maintain the same ownership over time. For example, if an investor owns 10% of the company, they'll have the right to invest up to 10% of the next financing. So 2 million of a 20 million dollar round. Why is that so important to investors? Well, if you invested at the seed stage in a company like Uber and didn't participate in any follow on investing, you probably would have left billions on the table from not doubling down. Probably more money than you would have made in the first place with your original seed check. Another major investor right is information rights. Details on the business that the company has to share with investors. That's important so that investors can know how things are going and can better decide whether or not they want to continue investing and exercise their pro rata, for example. So to recap, there's seven major terms that you need to know for equity priced rounds. The price and valuation, options pool, and liquidity preference, all of which affect the economics of a deal. And then major investor rights like pro rata rights, board seats, founder vesting, and protected provisions, which constitute the major control terms of a deal. As you might guess, most equity price rounds involve a lot of negotiating on those key terms. You have to involve lawyers to finalize all of this in what's called a closing process that could take up to several months and $25,000 to $100,000. In the very early stages of a company, it's often just not worth that headache, and that's why many founders opt for a convertible note instead. With a convertible note, no shares are actually issued or sold. There's just the promise that a VC's investment gives them the right to receive shares as part of an equity price round down the road if and when that happens. So you're basically tabling most of the hard work of negotiating the terms we discussed until a later date. And at that point, all of the note holders can piggyback off the work of a new lead investor who can negotiate on their behalf. So as a result, the convertible note is simpler, faster, and cheaper, and a very common way of raising your first money so you can get back to building as soon as you can. It's becoming common to use an even more simplified convertible note structure called a safe note, which anyone can download online and use without lawyers. In a safe note, you only need to negotiate three things, the valuation, the discount, and pro rata rights. The valuation cap dictates the highest price that the investor will pay when the notes eventually convert into a priced round. Valuation caps can either be set on a pre-money or a post-money basis. It's generally cleaner to do it on a post-money basis because then you can more easily calculate the ownership for the investor and the dilution you take as a founder. Remember that number is just the amount invested divided by the post money valuation. Safe notes can also have a discount rate to the future valuation of the priced round. In that case, when the notes convert into the priced round, investors choose either the discount rate or the valuation cap, whichever is the better deal for them. Let's walk through an example. Let's say a VC invests a million on a 10 million post money valuation cap safe with a 20% discount. Pretty typical deal for Silicon Valley for a seed round these days. The company executes and grows well, and two years later raises a priced round Series A of 20 million at 100 million valuation. The safe note holders then get issued shares at a price corresponding to a company valuation of 10 million, not 100 million, and they see a nice markup for getting in early. But let's say the company doesn't do well and raises a down round at a $5 million valuation. Then the safe note holders get issued shares at a price corresponding to a company valuation of 4 million, a 20% discount to the 5 million, rather than 10 million, which would have been a higher price and worse for the investors. 
So in both scenarios, whether the company does well or poorly, or whether a price round happens that's higher or lower in valuation, the safe note holder is protecting themselves in exchange for investing early. Every once in a while, a company can raise an uncapped note where an investor is basically agreeing to pay whatever a future investor down the road is going to pay. But that's a pretty bad idea for most investors who are taking greater risk for the same price as the later stage investor. Now, mechanically, what actually happens during a price round is that the safes convert first, then the options pool gets put into place, and finally the new money comes in. So let's go back to our example company that raised a million dollar seed investment on a 10 million post money cap safe. If the company then raises a $10 million Series A price round, the first step is the safes convert and the seed investor gets 10% of the company with the founders owning the remaining 90%. Then the 10% options pool comes in and dilutes everybody down equally by 10%. And finally, the Series A investor comes in with a 20 million investment at 100 million post money valuation, taking 20% of the company. That's going to dilute the seed investor and founders down again, but then you have to true up the options pool so it stays at 10% at the conclusion of the financing. So here's what you're left with at the end of the day. The real math of a fundraise is actually more complicated than this because you have to take these valuation numbers and translate them into a specific number of shares issued and bought at a certain price per share. But this gives you a rough idea of how it all works at a high level. And when you do raise a price round, you'll have the benefit of lawyers and advisors who are gonna help you out with this anyways. Remember all those control provisions I mentioned for price rounds? Yeah, those aren't usually a thing with safes with the possible exception of pro rata rights. As I mentioned before, the right to continue investing in later rounds is really important for certain investors. So they may ask for a pro rata side letter on top of the safe note. And generally only major investors and bigger funds targeting say five or 10% or more ownership will ask or expect this. That covers the basics of a safe note. A convertible note has one extra layer of complexity added on top of a safe, which is an interest rate that accrues over time to be paid back in cash or in stock to investor by some maturity date. That interest rate actually sits senior to other investors, meaning it gets paid back first. And so as a result, convertible notes are considered more debt-like than safes. So the convertible note is a bit more flexible in giving downside protection to investors and can involve a bit more negotiation than a safe. To recap, you have three main ways to raise money from VCs that sit on a spectrum from simple and fast to complex and slow with safes on one side and price rounds on the other. The more money you raise, naturally the more it makes sense to bake in more investor protections. So if you raise a few hundred thousand bucks or say anything less than a million, typically that's done through a safe. But if you raise say five million or more, more often than not, that's done through a priced equity round. With all that said, now you should be able to understand the terminology of startup deals and how they work. It may be confusing, but it's worth understanding as a founder what you're getting into when you negotiate and sign a deal. And at the end of the day, understanding this will help you structure your fundraise to better align incentives and set your company up to be a massive, enduring success. If you found this video useful, please like, subscribe, and comment, and let me know what else you'd like to see covered. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll catch you on the next video.